Hello and welcome at the Embedded World 2022, back in Nuremberg. Today with me at the Electro booth is Ivan Upton. Great so to be we, here. So we can talk a little bit about the Raspberry Pi. It's now 10 years old. Yeah, it's incredible, right? So um, uh, this is, Embedded World is our, is our home. It's where we launched Raspberry Pi on the 29th of February 2012. Uh, this is actually the first time we've ever exhibited. We, uh, we launched the product on our licensee partner stands here 10 years ago. First time we've ever exhibited. So you have your small little booth here, and mm. people are come by, and it's really crowded. So yeah, um, I guess probably the big news for us here, you know, where a decade ago we were launching a Linux-based computer here at Embedded World. Um, last year we launched our first microcontroller. We launched both our first microcontroller-based product, the Raspberry Pi Pico, um, and we also launched the that's built on our for the first time on silicon that we designed ourselves at Raspberry Pi. And really, the message we're bringing to Embedded World this year is that. In this year of shortages, we have microcontrollers, they are performant, they're cost effective, and most importantly, they're available. Uh, speaking of shortages, something we have to ask is the general situation for the Raspberry Pi 3 and 4 models that mm. is currently not as it should be. Yeah, that's right. Um, one of the, uh, I guess one of the key one of the key value propositions after we got out of that first, uh, the first rush of launch in 2012, a, a key value proposition for Raspberry Pi, particularly in the industrial and embedded space, has been general availability. You can buy Raspberry, very large numbers of Raspberry Pi products from stock for next day delivery. Uh, that's almost unheard of in the space we're in. This is very much a build to order, build to lead time business, and we are uh, rare in being a build to stock company in that space. Now what's happened over the last year is that a variety of supply chain challenges have, I guess, depleted our ability to sustain inventory of our products in the channel. Um, we're working very hard, obviously, at the moment to maximize the number of Raspberry Pis we can manufacture. We're working very hard to get those Raspberry Pis to the places, particularly to the OEM customers who need them in the right quantities. You know, what's bad for us? Units going to um, scalpers. Uh, units going to, I mean, of course, that's the worst possible thing, right? Yeah. Raspberry Pi is going out of the door, and then the first thing that happens is they're resold to uh, individuals or to embedded customers at a multiple of their true value. Yeah. Um, we also don't like it when units go to, obviously, we don't like it when OEMs are starved of Raspberry Pis and are mm -hmm. unable to build their derived products, but we also don't like it if OEMs feel that they have to stockpile Raspberry Pis in order to have certainty of supply. So really the big focus for us this year has been getting in touch with our OEM customer base, understanding what we call their true demand, their unpadded, true drop-dead demand, what they need in order to keep their businesses running, and then doing what we can to, to, to get the supplies of Raspberry Pi's we are able to make to those customers in a timely fashion. One question that may arise is in, from our viewers is what is currently stopping you from stripping out more? Is it, is it like a 10 cent component or is something more crucial? I, I think it's, it's, it's broadly speaking, it's everything. So okay. this is not a, uh, you know, this is obviously a uh, situation which is affecting everybody in this building. Uh, it's a situation uh, affecting everybody who builds or consumes electronics products, whether that's uh, an industrial single board computer or whether that's a car. You know, the number of cars that are parked out there, and we've all seen the satellite pictures of lots of cars yeah. with no engine management computers in. So this is a very broad based supply chain challenge. It results from the, I guess the, um, the negative going uh, supply and the positive going demand that occurred at the start of the pandemic two years ago, this is a downstream consequence of that. Um, for us, what this translates into is on any given day, there will be a component, which is the component which is limiting us. Enormous amount of effort goes in in the technical team and the commercial team at Raspberry Pi to find alternatives, you know, to find uh, better ways, faster ways of sourcing the components we need to to design and redesign our products in order to be able to use a broader range of alternative components. But there's no one, there's no, on no, I would say I've never had a, I, in the, I guess, 15 months maybe that we've been in something you would consider to be a shortage situation. I wouldn't say there's been a continuous period of a month where I could put my finger on one particular component or one particular vendor as being the challenge. Yep. So it will take a few years until this really resolves or it's just more months? I, um, I cease to make predictions. I think, I think trying to make predictions about this, this is a, a very complicated dynamic environment. Um, I think the attempt to make predictions has made fools of all of us mm. over the years. Yeah. So I think what we're doing is we are very, very focused on how we manage our customers through the situation for however long it takes. 
But what you are pumping out in vast numbers is the RP2040. That, so. That's right. So you know, this is the this is the good news. This is the good news that we brought to the show here. We brought 25,000 Raspberry Pi Pico boards, uh, each of which has an, a Raspberry Pi RP2040 microcontroller on it. Um, we've been making those available to people here. Really, the message is we have something which is performant, which is cost effective, and is available. Um, speaking of the first generation of the 2040, is there already in mind a second generation? Well, I mean, as you know, we don't talk about unannounced products. Um, yeah. I think one of the great things about getting RP2040 in the market and getting it in the market at a time like this where there is shortage, and that shortage does promote um, engineer engagement with the platform in a way that might might have been slower to I think it would always been it's been a huge success. For us. I think it would always have been a success, but that that success has been accelerated by the shortage environment. One of the wonderful things about being in the market is you are in you're touching customers. We've always talked about in Raspberry Pi trying to get into the market mm. and then iterate your product once you're in the market. So I think we are learning lessons that would inform a subsequent microcontroller design. Um, I think we're some distance away. We're very focused on RP24. Yeah. But your customers give you feedback what they would like to Absolutely. see added to the product itself. Absolutely, and that's the advantage of being in the market with a product. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think when the time comes, and that time is not today, but when yep. the time comes, I think we have a, probably we have a trove of um, things that we might have put in RP2040, but uh, were removed due to schedule pressure. Mm -hmm. Things that we've realized subsequent to the tape out um, that we wish we put in. And things our customers have told us subsequent mm -hmm. to availability that they wish we put in. And those will be the kind of things that inform when we get to the point of doing product definition for a successor. Those are the things that will inform that process. Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing you talked in the electro interview for the 10th anniversary for the Raspberry Pi was uh, Risk Five. It's mm -hmm. it's a top. It's, it's something you you are looking at from the microcontroller perspective. That's right. So we're a member of the Risk Five Foundation. Uh, you know, it's a very interesting technology. I think um, it probably is more relevant in my mind. It is more relevant to the microcontroller and deep embedded core space than it is to the traditional Raspberry Pi. One. There's an enormous amount of both hardware and software engineering would need to happen to make RISC-V um, credible as an ARM alternative in the A-class mm -hmm. space. The microcontroller space stacks are shallower. Um, uh, um, uh, people's, by and large, yeah, stacks are shallower. There is a much smaller quantity of software in a microcontroller, and therefore the amount of adaptation needs to be made to use a different instruction set architecture is smaller. You know, again, we don't talk about unannounced products, so I'm not here to announce a Risk Five based Raspberry microcontroller. But it is certainly somewhere. Yeah, you know, we've yet to turn our membership of the Risk Five Foundation into a concrete impact in the world, mm -hmm. and probably microcontrollers. If that does happen, microcontrollers is probably where it will happen. Yeah, the people that follow your team members uh, online on the various social media may mm -hmm. have noticed that your guys are already playing with Risk Five. Ah, you're talking about Luke. You're talking about our friend yeah. Luke Ren. Um, yeah, I mean, Luke's fantastic. He, uh, he joined us as a grad, well, he was actually a, a summer student with us mm. all the way through his undergraduate career. He joined us as a graduate a couple of years mm. ago. Absolutely amazing engineer. As you've probably seen on Twitter, has built yep. a three-stage pipeline uh, RISC, uh, RISC-V um, core with quite a lot of the trimmings, quite a lot mm. of the optional features, and has done that really from scratch. And, and, and critically, so there on GitHub, he's done it in the open, which is yep. lovely, so people can have confidence that this is all his own work. So I'm super excited about that. Yep, and he's also done a kind of a small gaming console also. Yeah, yeah you know, so he's, um, yeah, he's, uh, he's a multi-talented, he's a multi-talented chap. He's a guy who, uh, um, when I'm in the office with him, I have to work very hard not to sap his productivity by mm. going over to his desk and talking to him. We love <laughs> it. Yep. Um, something we also have mentioned in the last interview written in the Electro is the green awareness mm, point of yeah. the Raspberry Pi, you managed to cut down the energy consumption for the Raspberry Pi 4 mm. to save a lot of idle consumption yes. and energy. Yes. Yes. Uh, for the Raspberry Pi PiCon, also for the Raspberry Pi 4, you mentioned in the article that the PCB material that's currently used is not really nice to recycle, if possible at all. Mm. So yeah. if you look into alternatives to make, it, for example, the Pico greener even. Mm. So we're aware of, uh, and, you know, uh, Pico might be an interesting opportunity here because it's a two layer, the yeah. Pico is a two layer PCB. Um, uh, and so it's more likely as some of these more eco-friendly PCB substrate technologies come along, it's likely that they will appear in the two layer PTH world long before they appear in the kind of four layer, six layer with microvires, high density interconnect world. Um, no, we don't have specific engineering activities going on there. Yes, we are aware of the technologies and we're keeping an eye on them. I would love to have, you know, if you look at the, the kind of, look at electronics in the circular economy. Mm -hmm. 
um, really the the um, poor recyclability characteristics yeah. of FR4 is really is one of the things that prevents you from efficiently building circular or near circular electronic supply chains. I'm um, talking about circular economy. Um, the defective Pi 4 that are out in the fields, is there any plan to get them back to the factory to, to salvage the main usable components to get even more out of it? Or is it something that's currently not that easy to do? Uh, the, failure rates are, the failure rates are pretty low, right? So, yeah, yeah, but so it's kind of, it's one of those ones where it's always a challenge when you have a, a product which is available at a very low cost mm. um, and which has very low failure rates. Um, it, it's, it can be hard to it can be hard to, the low cost makes mm. it hard to fit the logistics because you, you need to have a, a value proposition mm. to the user to get that, to, to incentivize them to do something other than drop that device in the wee yeah. bin. Um, and so I think it's probably more likely to the extent that we do this, we don't currently have engagements with we, uh, with, uh, we uh, the, with companies that implement the Waste Electronic mm. Equipment Directive. Um, uh, it's probably more likely that you could you know, you, you could leverage a relationship there to recover parts, but really the low the low cost structure of yeah, you know, to the extent that we have a focus on um, greenness, mm. to the extent that we have a focus on reducing resource consumption, it's always about reducing. It tends to be about reducing the primary the the primary resource intensity mm. of, the, of, the, of the product, not attempting to eke out incremental gains through the recycling or reuse of individual components. It's incredibly labor intensive. And remember, something that's labor intensive is, yeah. is not especially green, because when you, you have a labor intensive process, you have to account for all of the carbon emissions of the people in their lives who are involved in this, who could be doing something else. Mm. You have to roll those carbon emissions up into your estimate of whether that optimization was worth doing. Okay, so. Uh, I've seen for the for the Pi three you've collected working models, mm. and, and, and we have and we have a fantastic relationship. Um, RS uh, RS Components, okay, do one of our licensees does have a what do they call it? Is it reuse? It's a Pi reuse or something? Mm. Yeah. They have a they have a scheme for recovering them from the field. Um, it definitely works, um, but again, it's that question of incentives. It's very hard in thirty five dollars if you're talking yeah. about. You know, what have you got to fit into $35? You've got to fit um, the, an incentive mm -hmm. to the person to return. You've got to fit inbound logistics. You have to fit retest. You have to fit outbound logistics, or you rework and retest. You have to fit out on, outbound logistics. And you have to fit some, in normal times, you have to fit some sort of discount to incentivize an end user to take a reconditioned unit rather than a new unit. It's extremely hard to fit all those things into $35. Yeah. I mean, with the current prices and market situation, that might, yes, that might be something different, but yeah, still. Certainly, that discount, certainly you could imagine that that discount could be replaced with availability. Yeah. yeah that, that that's the, 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 the downstream incentive is not, is cheaper, but is, is more available. Yeah. I mean, you don't talk about not announce, not develop products, mm -hmm. but if you say, where would you like to see the Raspberry Pi in five or 10 years? Um, look, we've always seen ourselves as a PC company. We've always described ourselves as a PC company. One of the interesting things that had happened in the pandemic was we were very successful in getting Raspberry Pis into the hands of young people, disadvantaged young people in the UK. Had some amazing philanthropic support, in particular from the Bloomfield Trust, um, to get uh, to get these units out to people. So, I mean, I'd love to see Raspberry Pi. Obviously, the foundation is making incredible impact in the UK and elsewhere now in um, computing education, teaching people about computers. But where I think there's a real opportunity is, uh, I still believe, I've always believed this with Raspberry Pi, is there's an amazing opportunity in computing for education. Raspberry Pi is a way of providing a low cost, high performance, general purpose computing platform, not just for learning about computers, but for learning English, for learning French, for doing all of those things that, I, I guess going into the pandemic, we assumed that everybody had a computer to do this with. The pandemic has really shone a light on an existing structural inequality in our system. I'd love to see Raspberry Pi take a role in trying to address that inequality. You said once back in the days that you would love to see a Raspberry Pi combined with a real NVIDIA or AMD graphic cards mm. to do Doom in, in 4K. Yeah. Um, you have may have seen that there are some things that... Jeff has been, uh, Jeff Gehrling has been, uh, has been beating his head against this problem for mm. quite a while. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, these cards are not designed to talk to the kind of embedded PCI Express root complex that we have in our SSCs. They're designed to talk to big, multi-lane, sophisticated root complexes in extremely expensive Intel and AMD chips. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting challenge. Um, 
whether it will ever be, yeah, I suspect what we'll find is in some future generation of Raspberry Pi products, that will be much more achievable than it is today. Whether it will ever become a mainstream use of the platform, whether it will ever become something where you can really put your finger on it and say, yeah, that's a great idea, you should definitely be doing that, is another question. But it will always be an interesting curio. Okay, so maybe for not announced products, whenever, wherever. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. Um, I think from our side, the, the questions we can ask are done. Good. Um, I hope we still get at some point more exciting news. Yes. Well, there will always be exciting news from Raspberry Pi. You know, it's, it's you know we you know we've been doing fun stuff for ten years. I'm still I'm still running Raspberry Pi ten years after we sold the first Raspberry Pi nearly 14 years after we incorporated the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Uh, it's still a super exciting thing for, to do, and it's a super exciting thing to do because we continue to be able to offer interesting new things to our customers. You know, in some years, those are going to be revisions of the main product. In some years, those are going to be accessories, or they're going to be pieces of software. But we will kind of continue trying to make the Raspberry Pi world exciting for the huge, now huge number of people who've been touched by the platform. Yep. So will you back for the 16th birthday? It should be really on the, be able to be on that date. Well, that's the one. Yeah, obviously the we owe our 29th of our strange 29th of February birthday to our determination to launch an embedded world in 2012. Yeah, I think we should be back maybe for our 12th birthday in two years' time. Maybe for our 16th birthday four years after that. Okay. So thanks for your time. Thank thanks you very for much the, indeed. Ben, have a good show. Cheers. Stay healthy. Thank you.